الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سورة يوسف ورس نمبر 26 سورة يوسف ورس نمبر 26 It's a very brief recap. He is in the palace and he is in the room with the wife of Aziz and Nisr, Zulekha. And when he runs towards the door to save himself, standing at the door is the husband. So Zulekha, she says that he tried to seduce. Then Yusuf al-Islam replied, he clarifies that no Qala, he said, that it was Zulekha who sought to seduce me. And a witness from her family testified, we did this earlier, this is referring to a small child who testified to the Masumiyat of Sayyidina Yusuf al -Islam. And he said that in Kana Kamisuhu, that if the shirt of Yusuf is torn from the front, then Zulekha, she is telling the truth, that she was being harassed. And so the Yusuf is would give up the lies. On the other hand, but if the shirt is torn from the back side, but then she has lied. And he is of the truthful. And the Sayyidina Yusuf is truthful. This is a very logical and a rational way to judge a situation. If Sayyidina Yusuf is running in front and the woman is chasing her, so if the shirt is thrown from the back side, that means that she was seducing him and he was running away. And if it's the opposite, if it's thrown from the front side, that means that Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam was after her and she was saving herself. So now when they look at the Kameez, what do they say? Falamma ra'a kameezahu. So when her husband, he saw the shirt of Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam, khudda min duburin. The shirt was thrown from the back, which meant that Zulekha she was to be blamed, that she was chasing after him and she tore the shirt from the hand. And when the husband, he saw this, he immediately said, Innahu min kaidi kunna. That indeed, this is of the women, their planning, their ploy, their plotting. Inna kaida kunna adin. And indeed, the planning and ploy and the plotting of women is very great. So we understand from this a couple of lessons. Number one, that Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam, he was sincere, he was mukhlis, he was true in his relationship with Allah. And when a person is always mukhlis with Allah, mukhlis with their own self, then Allah's father protects a person's ethos. Allah protects a person's wealth. Allah protects everything about that person. And we see here that there were two, this is a child, he testified. And in the testimony of that child, it will be the two miracles of Sayyidina Yusuf The first miracle is just the fact that the child is able to speak. That itself is a mojaza, that doesn't happen. And second, the child is speaking so intelligently, such a rationally, so rationally and telling that check the shirt and see that if it's torn from this side, then this has happened, and torn from the other side, and that has happened. So, this proved the innocence of Sayyidina Yusuf salam. And a person, whoever has good intentions, and this is a point which we hinted before also, whoever has good intentions and they're true and sincere, then Allah Subhanahu wa always protects them. Allah Subhanahu wa makes other people, makes creation testify to their innocence. Some of the scholars, they write something very ajeeb and interesting. They say that if a person is true in themselves, 
I'm true in the relationship with Allah, then Allah SWT can even make pebbles and rocks speak about your innocence. Allah is Al-Malik, Allah is Al-Qadir. Allah can make even dead rocks speak and testify in favor of you. Provided that a person is true in themselves and true in the relationship with Allah. So this is a principle that whoever fixes their relationship with Allah then Allah will fix the relationship with every other person, other people around them. The mistake that we do here is that we try so much to win over other people. We are doing so much for the other person in our lives. And after doing so much, at the end of the day, we still feel that they have misgivings for me. They have mis... You know, they're not thinking well about me. They're backbiting against me. They're slanting against me. We do so much for them and still at the end of the day a person feels that we're not getting our love repaid. And the muscle of the real issue is this, that we haven't fixed our relationship with Allah's father and that's why Allah lets those misgivings his giving, his remain there. And that's why people continue to harbor these ill feelings towards us. If only we can work on our relationship with Allah fix that Allah will take care of our other relationships. And we see that in the no greater example of the Sunnah of the Prophet. The Prophet says, you know, he had people in Quraysh and Makkah that died hard, hard for enemies. And when the Prophet migrated to Madinah, they chased, they went after one battle, second battle. And there was a woman by the name of Inda. She, she first hired a person to kill. Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala. And then she went into the battlefield and desecrated the body of, the, of Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala. Took out the organs, the limbs, and threw them into like a thread, a necklace, wore that necklace around her neck. Just imagine how much hatred, how much bitterness there would be in her heart. But what is interesting is that the thing women at the time of Fatah Makkah, when the Prophet came and entered Makkah in the Quran, she came to the Prophet when she recited the Talama and then said something interesting. So today I declare my faith in you in this day. And I also say, in front of all these people gathered, that before this day, your tent is, she's addressing the Prophet, that before this day, your tent was the most despicable tent in my eyes. And now in front of everyone else, I'm, I'm justifying that among all the tents in Arabia, I love your tent the most. Such a radical transformation in a heart. When a person fixes the relationship with Allah, Allah fixes the relationship with people around him. And then Aisha Rabbi Allah, she once gave a nasiya to a sahabi, beautiful words, beautiful nasiya. She said that if you win over Allah's father, if you fix your relationship with Allah, and in that process you end up displeasing any of the creation, then don't worry about that. Allah will become pleased with you and Allah will put muhabba in the heart of that person for you. And on the other hand, if you win over, if you please Mahlu, but in that process you end up displeasing Allah, then Allah will become upset with you and Allah will also create enmity and hatred in the hearts of people against you. So it's a very easy, simple principle that if a person can fix the relationship with Allah, Allah will fix our other relationships in our life. Now, the Aziz and Mr. he says something interesting, that inna qayda kunna adeem. He's referring to the women, that indeed the planning, the plotting, the ploys, the deception of women is great. What this refers to, it can be, you can take this both ways. So women, this can happen in sin. This can also happen in piety. So for example, a woman, if she wants, she can seduce a man. She can tempt a person. She can align towards sin. And she can actually take a person on that path and make that person commit sin as well. Right? In a hadith, one of the things that the Prophet said, is that one of the greatest fitna for men is, is, is this, that when a person is actually 
seduced and invited towards sin by a woman to say no, right? And say that Ma'ad Allah, I cannot do this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the hadiths we did this before as well is a person who is tempted by this and he responds and says that no, I can't do this. I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I cannot commit this sin with you. Then that person will get the shade on Yom al Qiyamah on that day when there'll be no other shit except for the shit of to do things which maybe that person doesn't want to do. I'm no greater example than this in the Quran that Fir'aun, his wife, now Fir'aun make a decision that I'm going to slaughter every single male baby of Bani Israel. And he went ahead and actually did that. But then when the time came for Sayyidina Musa salam, his wife, she said, Allah don't kill him. We'll adopt him as our son. We'll raise him up in our palace. And the home government was so strong that Fir'aun was not able to say no. He acceded. He agreed. And they took Sayyidina Musa salam, raised him up as their own son. Similarly, we see another example in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu when Sayyidina Umar an, before he accepted Islam, he has this naked sword in his hand set out with this mission that now was Kissa Khata. I just want to end this whole story about Islam. I just want to end. The Prophet of Islam, somewhere on the journey, a Sahabi meets and says, Sir, first take care of your own household. We have heard that your sister and your brother-in-law both of them have accepted the have accepted the kalama and become Muslims. He changes his direction, goes to his sister's house, and when he knocks on the door, he hears that there's someone reciting some ayat from inside. It was actually a third Sahabi who was teaching both the sister and his brother, brother-in-law. So when he sees that Sayyidina Umar is on the door, he hides because Sayyidina Umar had that demeanor, people would be afraid of, scared of. So he hid inside, he hid, he hid behind. In that place, Sayyidina Umar only enters and he asks his brother-in-law, what were you reciting? And first they tried to hide and conceal, but then he said that we were reciting this. And he said that, have you accepted the kalama without my agreement, without my approval? And he tried to hit her. And when he was trying to hit him, his sister Sayyidina Fatima, she came, she stepped inside. She stepped in the middle. And as a result, his hand fell on her. So when she was hit by her brother, she said, she responded, ajib words, golden words. She said that, Omar, Omar, me and you, both of us, we have drank the milk of the same mother. We have drank the milk of the same mother. You can take life out of my jism, but you cannot take a root. You cannot take this iman from my heart. And those words were so strong, so intense, so powerful, they in fact it straight the heart of Sayyidina Umar Ta'ala. He meditated. And the story goes that eventually he accepted Islam. So Allah Subhanahu has given Muhammad that potential that can use it either way, right? On the path of sin, on the path of piety and taqwa as well. In Kaida Kunna Adin, so the planning of women is great. Now, there are two enemies that a person has. One is the shaitan, which is an external enemy. And the other enemy, which, which, which invites us, incites us to do sin, is actually our own base self, which in Arabic is called nafs. Nafs is that part of our human body which has desires. It's the seat of desires. It's not necessarily bad. You can have good desires. I want to become so pleasing in the sight of Allah. I want to pray the hajjah. But you can also have bad desires. The seat of desires is the person's nafs. And interestingly, in the Quran, Allah speaks about the deception, the planning, the plotting of these enemies. And about shaitan, what Allah says is that inna kaida shaitani, inna kaida shaitani kana da'ifa. That the makar, the deception, the planning, the plotting of shaitan is zaif, it's weak. But when it comes to the planning of a person's nafs, their base self, their base desires, Allah saying, Inna kaida kunna adeen. The planning, the deception of this nafs is adeen. 
So we understand from this actually, nafs is a more dangerous enemy than shaitan. Shaitan is outward. Shaitan can just put the waspasa inside of our heart. But the actual taking hold of your hand and making sure that a person commits sin, you need a tag team partner. Like you have an inside enemy, right? Someone who gives the inside information. That's what the nafs does. Then shaitan puts the waspasa and then the nafs does the rest. So nafs is a more dangerous enemy. And all of us are actually familiar with this. The inside enemies are more dangerous. It's a beloved friend. You don't even view that. Many of us, we don't even view our nafs to be an enemy. We are in our love for the nafs. We begin to overlook the faults, the flaws of our nafs. And if you think about this, what made shaitan shaitan? Shaitan was a jinn. There was no shaitan at that time to make shaitan shaitan. Shaitan had his own nafs. His nafs made him shaitan, made Azaziz turn into shaitan. So the point is that whenever a person has these base unlawful desires which are coming from a person's nafs, you're supposed to fight them. Whenever you feel there's some desire that is so great, that it's becoming an obstacle, an impediment in religion, in the path towards Allah, then it should be stopped. One sort of should try to train themselves, discipline on themselves in such a way that they fight the resist. They're able to say no. They are dominating their nafs as opposed to the nafs dominating them. That's really what we are. Abdullah. That you become the servant of Allah as opposed to becoming the servant of your nafs. Abdullah. So when the husband, he says this, so the next thing the husband, he does is he wants to, this is a crisis management situation. His own wife, she is seduced. And he also knows that she is the culprit. And so then Yusuf Islam, he is righteous, he is pure, he is innocent. Now, this Aziz al-Misri was an intelligent man, he was a wise man, he was a just ruler. And look at the way he deals with the situation, a lesson for me and you to learn here. First thing is, he addresses him in Yusuf al-Islam and says, Yusuf, Yusuf, just ignore this, just leave this matter. Because this was a matter which would scar his own reputation. If it went outside the room, if it went outside the palace, if this became public, his reputation would be at stake. Because he knows that she made a mistake. So first thing he says, it's like Yusuf al-Islam just ignore, leaves the matter. And she, in her womanly passion, she made a mistake. Her nafs overcame her, dominated her, and just let it go. And you keep the moral high ground that you are loyal. You have nobility inside of you, loyalty inside of you. So you act with that nobility. Noble people, whatever is inside that comes outside. People are noble when they interact with others. Even in such situations, their nobility comes out. And their loyalty comes out. And remember, he had an ihsan upon Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam by giving him a very good lodging, a place at Kikana in his own palace. Right? So he invokes that loyalty, that nobility, and says that just to deal with that situation, deal in this situation with that same level of loyalty and nobility that you have overlooked this. And then look at this. How does he address his own wives? He says to her, That, oh, you ask forgiveness for your sin. Indeed, you were one who made this mistake. You did this khata. You were sinful. And again, this shows the hikmat of this, of this person. He's very wise. He says he understood that she did this amal out of her weak, womanly passions. He didn't take it personally. That she doesn't love me. That she betrayed me. That she's not happy with me. Right? She, you know, he, he understands that she's doing this because of her womanly passions. She's overtaken, dominated by her unlawful desires. So what is actually the tariqa, the salika he's using here is that he's counseling her. He's counseling her, telling her that seek forgiveness from Allah. He's not beating her up or punishing her because he understands, right, that this would be a sin in the sight of Allah as well. So it's a beautiful way to understand how to deal with a situation where you have a spouse who is in an extramarital affair, almost, right? 
but still that spouse is actually someone who was loved, who loves you, has compassion for you. So in that case, a person might confront them, right? like he's doing here. He confronts her, he counsels her, he tells her to seek forgiveness, to mend her ways to repent, right? Not just, you know, having a stick and beating or punishing, because if you start to be a sin as well, then what happens is, meanwhile, he wants to keep it private. But somehow the news spreads outside the palace. And Allah subhanahu wa says, وَقَالَ نِسْوَةٌ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ And the women in the city, they said, now the, here the question comes up, that how did the women outside the palace find out about this? How did they get to know about this whole incident? Up till now, if you look at the story, only three people know. One is Zulekha, and this is her own Amal. She would not dare to tell anyone else because this certain mistake is her sin. She would try to conceal, hide this. Second person is Sayyidina Yusuf Islam, and Sayyidina Yusuf Islam, his the, the Aziz Abyssar said to him that Aarid and Hada, leave this, ignore this. And he was loyal to his master. So he would not leak this news to other people. You couldn't imagine that would happen from his side. And the third person knows this incident is Aziz Emissar. It's his own reputation at stake. He would never disclose this to anyone else. So the Mufassirin have written that actually it was the servants in the house who could put two plus two equals four because they knew how Zulekha she was interacting with Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam. She had feelings, she had emotions. And they could figure it out that there's something happening here. And they found out about this. And they then leaked this news. And hence, it became the talk of the town. This is teaching us a very important lesson. That how should a person interact with their servants? And you know, we have these maids culture. Right? Maids, Masi, driver, all of these, you know, this extra help that we have at home, one should be very careful. These women of the town, they're talking about this. The news leaked out because of these servants and maids and helpers. And good things, they also get leaked out. And that's why one should be very cautious in the way we interact with our servants. Let me give you a few now, the common things, and some of you will be familiar with this as well, between the parents, they're thinking about what would be a suitable rishta. And the, you know, it's happening in front of some cook, babarchi, driver, someone, and they find out about this. And when they find out about this, they leak it to other people, other people, other relatives find out. You're hiding it from those people, and they find out about this, right? You plan to do something, you haven't done anything yet. And because it's planning process, but sometimes other people in your family find out about it. How? Because the servants are leaking. Similarly, sometimes there's some takrar, some dispute between husband and wife. Voices are raised, volume is raised. And halak, it's nothing serious, but you know, people hear, the servants they hear, and then they just make it into a big issue. And other people, the neighborhood finds out, the whole community finds out that something happened last night here in this house, right? So one has to be careful. The rules are that one should be cautious. An important talk should always be done behind closed chambers, not in areas where other people, third party, can actually listen and not speak unnecessarily before. There's no need to speak right unnecessarily before your maid. The maids actually know more about the house than the husband, right? Right? They know every single thing, how, where, what, how everything is, the nizam, how everything is being run. And also not speak about everything before our service, right? There is a hakika, there is a reality to do that. So important lesson is to maintain privacy. Otherwise, every news, whether good or bad, favorable or against you, just leak out of your house. In Pakistani society, we have another masla that sometimes uh, men are also guilty of this, that you tell one and it just spreads outside. 
and women mashallah they're also guilty of this right to so tell women and it just leaks out ho sakta hai speed zyada ho it leaks out much more quickly all you have to do is just tell one person ki bas ye kisi ko batana nahi hai aapne bas kabhi na kisi ko batana nahi hai that's enough to make it into a broadcast agency and uh, basically everything will be revealed right my mother in law is like this my sister in law is like this my daughter my son expecting a baby <laughs> everything right will be leaked out and then what happens wa qala nisfatun fil madinati the women in the city they say that imra'atul azizi the wife of aziz ha turavidu fataha an nafsihi she is seeking to seduce her young boy man fata this arabic word means young man so the yusuf al islam at this time was a young different ways this youth is a time when a person is tested by allah but i will also i will also say that youth is also a time when a person can draw close to allah it's a moment of opportunity as well a time to turn back to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's so many stories in the quran that mentions about this how young people young men young women they strove towards allah in their youth they sought out allah they reached out for allah they had this yearning longing to be with allah to set out on this path to develop a relationship with allah in their youth as it ibrahim alayhis salam he was tested by allah right tested thrown in the fire but at the same time you know this was when he was a young man but at the same time while he was a young man he also had this inquisitive feeling in his heart that i need to discover my rab and there's a famous story all of you know that that he sat out he looked at the sky that he looked at the moon the stars the sun and said this cannot be my rab this is an inquiry searching for his lord right in his youth all of a sudden this curiosity that i want to discover my lord i want to know my lord i want to have a relationship a talmud with my rab that's what youth is all about that a person starts thinking wondering discovering this relationship who i am where i belong and how can i discover my allah spatter you see that in the story of sayyidina musa alayhi salam as well he was tested when he was a young man he punched a, pe- a person of the fir on and he had to flee from that area and while he is fleeing he flees into the protection of allah spatter he is seeking the madad of allah he is searching for allah spatter and then eventually actually makes a dua to allah as well that allah save me from this najjini min qaum zalimi save me and grant me whatever khair whatever khair that you have destined for me you see this in the story of sayyidina yusuf al islam as well sayyidina yusuf al islam he is being tested in this way right tested seduced the temptation a woman is tempting her but he is running away fleeing from that and then allah will also say allah will give him allah will reward him for this where that he says maaza allah that i cannot do this and allah was going to reward him for that and his age is also is a young man at that time there in surah kahf allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a story about another group of young men young men who were also tested by allah that they had this iman they wanted to protect their iman but the society was against them and the society was trying to take away their very iman from their hearts so in this test in this temptation this trial that they were going through they thought that we have to protect our iman they fled they sought allah's protection they went inside a cave in that cave they're searching for allah ask allah for protection for rahma for guidance and allah gave them that guidance they're also young men so we understand this this youth is the area it's a period of strength it's an area it's an, it's a, it's a time when a person has a lot of energy a lot of motivation a lot of determination a lot of himmat and if in a, if in their youth a person can turn to allah subhanahu and that's like the likeness of a nabi it's the likeness of a nabi because anbiya alayhis salam they turned to allah in their youth it's like following the model of sayyidina ibrahim alayhis salam following the model of sayyidina musa alayhis salam 
following the Muhammad Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, following the example of these people, the ashab e kahaf. That's what they did. That's what their sunnah is. Old age with the, every person, right? When you have nothing else to do, when there are no desires, no temptations, when you have all the free time, then everyone, you know, they turn back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In their youth, turning to Allah, this is the likeness of the angels. And that's why in one hadith, the Prophet said that one person who will be shaded by the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa on the day of Qiyamah, we already did one category, who says no to a sin. Another category is that young man who gave his youth, who gave his or her youth to Allah subhanahu wa that would also get the shade of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa and sometimes I say this in some of my university classes as well, that maybe, you know, the, the challenge for us has shifted, especially for university students. One of the biggest challenges that we are facing as university students is this philosophy of secularism, liberalism. This philosophy, this is also a fitna, right? This is also trying to take us away from Allah's path. Whether you know it or not, this is what it is. It's teaching you, it's a philosophy that is teaching you that you remove everything that is about Allah subhanahu wa from your life, right? You remove Allah subhanahu wa It teaches you that the only thing which is important in your life is that just be a good person. Just be good to other people around you. Be a good husband. Be a good wife. Be a good neighbor. Be a good citizen. Be a good student. Just be a good human being. Yani in the definition of a good human being, you don't need to be good to Allah, right? You don't need to be good to the Prophet sallallahu you extract Allah and the Prophet system out of the equation and just be good to everyone else. One scholar used to say this, that I can explain to you Islam, I can summarize the entirety of Islam in three sentences. That be good to Allah by doing ibadat of Allah, be good to the Prophet Sallallahu by following the Prophet Sallallahu and be good to the creation of Allah by serving them. What secularism does is that it cancels one and two Brings you down to only number three. That all you need to care about, all you need to worry is just be a good individual, good human being, good Muslim you know, in terms of your relationship with others. Doesn't matter how long, how often you think about Allah. And if you think about it, no, that's unconsciously, that's what we are being taught, right? That's what happens. It keeps us away from Allah's Allah. Everything keeps us away from even wanting Allah's Allah. If I ask a young man or a young woman on campus, how many times do you want Allah in your day? How many times do you even think about Allah during the day? How many times do you even remember Allah during the day? So what are you talking about? <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's crazy. Right? These are things which people don't even think about. People don't even dream about. If I ask you a list for me, your dream ambition, 10 things that you dream for your life. Allah will not be there even in the top 10 things that you have, that I want to become someone beloved to Allah. I want to become someone pleasing to Allah. It's not even there in the top 10 things that we want. Right? It's not even an aspiration, a goal, a vision. That's what happens. This, this, this is a challenge, right? It's an ideology which is dumbing us, which is removing Allah from everything, every aspect of our life, and just teaching us that you can be good without having Allah, without having the Prophet. That's it. So anyway, what they do is they start, uh, these women, they're saying that this Zulekha, she has been uh, charmed by Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam. She has been hooked. In your slang language, you would say, she is hooked with that young man. She's not able to control her desires, not able to control her feelings for him. And they're saying this, behind her back, right? Meaning and what they're thinking. What they're thinking, what they're thinking about her is the look, she is the wife of the king. She's the first lady. She's so noble. She has her own rank, her dignity, and yet she's falling for that young man, right? We think that she's very naive. She's very gullible. Inna la naraha fi I think we, she's made a mistake here. She's very easily, you know, she's naive and gullible. She is making a mistake here. She's making an error by falling in love with him. So when she, the women are now thinking, the women know about this, they're starting to discuss it. So this has now become the talk of the town. So now what does Zulekha do? She 
wants to clear her name. So she, Falalma Sami'at Bimakri Hinda. When she hears that other women in their town are now thinking about her and thinking that what happened to her, Vichari, she's so gullible, she's so naive, she's fallen over, you know, captivated in love for this young man. So she devises a strategy, Arsalat Ilai Hinna. She sends for all the women, come to my house, there is going to be a banquet. And she prepares for them a banquet, and each one of them are now seating. They're relaxed and comfortable. And in that posture, she presents a banquet with fruits, a variety of fruits in front of them. And then to each one of those women in the assembly, she hands over a knife, sikina, a knife. And she tells them to cut the fruits and eat and enjoy and be merry. And right at that time, she tells Sayyidina Yusuf Al-Islam that come out. I want you to come, present yourself in this, ga- in this gathering, present yourself before these women. So, she tells them, come out before them. Falamma ra'aynahu. Now, when the women, they saw, they see Sayyidina Musa Al-Islam, akbarnahu, they greatly admire him. Right? What you call head over heels, right? Akbarna, akbarnahu. Wa kalta'na idea hunna, so mesmerized, so shocked, so be dazzled by the husn, by the beauty of Sayyidina Yusuf salam, that they end up cutting their fingers. This is an ayat, right? Kalta'na idea hunna, they cut their own fingers, right? Yani they're lost in the beauty of Sayyidina Yusuf salam. So they end up cutting their own fingers, Bakulla, and they say, Hasha lillah, that perfect is Allah. Mahada Basha in Hada illa malakun kari. This cannot be a man. This cannot be a human being. Rather, he's some malak, he's some angel. Kareem is some noble, righteous, virtuous, chast angel. He cannot be an insan. So the women. They are now bedazzled by the beauty of Sayyidina Yusuf salam. And when Zulekha, she sees this, that women, they're also like me, right? They weren't able to control their emotions like I fell in love. They're also now falling in love with him. So at that time, she becomes a bit bold, a bit brave. And she says, that this is the one, this is that man, this is that person about whom you were doing ulamat to me. You were blaming me. You were telling stories about me. You were making fun of me. You were saying, I'm gullible. I'm naive. This was that young man about which you are baten karad. Walakad rawattuhu annafsihi. And now she becomes so bold, right? That seeing that, you know, they saw Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam. They're seeing Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam in one, for one moment. And in that one moment, they're so mesmerized, so bedazzled, they end up cutting their fingers. So Meto, I've been living with Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam in this house for so much, for such a long period of time. Right? If they weren't able to control themselves, then what about my state? That how difficult would it have been for me to control my desires, my feelings, my emotions, so then she reveals it. She says, you know, Yes, it was I who was seducing it. Right? Apna jo, that secret that she was hiding, she openly reveals, she confesses that you weren't able to control. Yes, I was the one who seduced him. However, first ta sama, he remained chaste. Right? I felt attracted to him. I sought to seduce him, but he remained virtuous. He was pure. He was innocent. He did not respond. And then she says, that if he will not do what I command him to do, what I order him to do, like use Jananna, then no, no, this is taqid. Certainly, indeed, and is zarur ba zarur ba zarur, I will imprison him. And he will be 
those who are degraded humiliated debased yani he'll be embarrassed he will be usko bahut hi puri saza di jayegi right now what happens here is that something interesting happened in the story that the women they were making fun of zulekha they thought that look at her she's not able to control herself and now when sidna yusuf al islam came before them they weren't able to control they fell in love all of them became aashiq right all of them become lovers wo keh rahe ki batao hum sab aashiq hain bata do jo bhi dil ke andar hai unhe bata bhi diya ki mere dil ke andar ye hai right she also became bored and in fact those women now are saying to yusuf al islam that go listen to your malka do what she is telling you to do just give in otherwise this is what is going to happen to you they are convincing yusuf al islam to just do this sin commit this sin with his malika the important lesson that we learn here is that when you see a fault in other people you should not make fun of that lest we also fall and we end up making that same mistake this the women of that city they saw a fault a flaw a mistake an error in zulekha right that she has given her heart to sidna yusuf al islam they thought ke hum to bahut acche right we are very pious we are chaste we won't fall for this we won't be such we won't be so gullible and so naive when their time came they also acted in the exact same fashion in one hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explained this and said that don't make fun or mock or ridicule your friend about some fault or flaw or some mistake perhaps allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might give them a fiat might give them a sanction might save them from that situation and you might get caught up in that very same sin that very same difficulty and truly this happens this happens so many times hence if any person receives any zillat if someone ends up in a sin someone makes a mistake one should not start rejoicing and celebrating right and clapping the look at them well because you know the tables can be turned the same situation can come upon us as well and if you think maybe some of you might have seen this in your own life in your own experiences right that so many times it happens so many people were rejoicing right now on the faults of other people only to make the same mistake later on in their own lives that's why to think that no i'm the paragon of you know i'm the paragon of chastity i'm the paragon of haya i'm the paragon of innocence mai to bahut acha hu and everyone else is a sinner this is a very great deception and a ploy of shaitan ye shaitan ka dhoka hai ye shaitan ka makar hai shaitan makes a person think like that that you are so virtuous and everyone else is so bad one should be very cautious and very of this attack of shaitan right rather what we should do is we should try to conceal the sins of other people agar kuch nazar bhi aa jata hai ala akhlaq acche akhlaq would be that you cover the faults of the other person and if this is very rewarding and avarti in one hadith the prophet sallam said that whoever removes flies makhiya from the izzat of his brother or sister and he is someone who overlooks their faults someone who defends them before other people then allah subhanahu will remove the fire of jahannam from the face of that person on the day of kiam you could choose it is name that allah will remove the fire of jahannam from the face of that person that person who defends the izzat of that of an some of his fellow friend right removes some zillat from that person Similarly, in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that man satar a Muslim man fi dunya that whoever conceals the faults of his brother or sister in this dunya, then Allah will conceal the fault of that person in this dunya wal akhirah in akhirah this one. So our Sharia is so beautiful. It says that okay, a question comes that okay, if I see someone in a mis- making a mistake. if i see someone in a tough time if i see someone in some musibat what should i do so shayad gives us that you should make a beautiful dua and dua is that if you see someone going through a tough time maybe they have a disease maybe they fell sick maybe you know just mundane things like car puncture puncture ho gaya right 
So whenever you see anyone in some musibat, we should make this dua. That Allahumma afini min mabtalaka bihi wa fadlani kathiran min ibadihi tafzila. That, oh Allah, all praise belongs to that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given me afiyat from the musibat that person is engaged in. And Allah has preferred me fazilat, given me fazilat over so many of your, over so many of his creation. And Allah has saved me from so many calamities, so many musibats that are falling upon other people. So this is a beautiful dua. When a person makes this dua, number one, it saves you from arrogance and pride. It's not you. Allah saved you. You're praising Allah. That Allah protected me. Allah saved me. So you get ajasi humility. And secondly, Allah will save one from falling into that musibat himself or herself. Allah will save you from that situation. So this is a sunnah dua we should try to memorize, learn, and recite. Any time when you see any bad thing happening to any other person, so we should recite this dua and we should have that humility. Inshallah, Allah will save us from falling into that very thing. So now we see that she has not made toba yet. Right? She is not that, you know, I make toba, I won't do this again. The, my husband is also saying, for stagfiri, make a stick for her, turn around. Oh, she hasn't made Tawbah. She's in fact saying that if you don't do what I'm commanding you to do, right? Wala illam yaf'al ma amruhu, then I'm going to imprison you. I'm going to disgrace you. I'm going to humiliate you. I'm going to imprison you, right? So when Sayyidina Yusuf al Islam, he hears this in front of all of this gathering of women, he responds. And this is an incredible statement. He says, Qala. Rabbi, now make, turning to Allah, making dua to Allah, Father, addressing Allah, Rabbi sijnu ahabbu ilayya mimma yad'unani ilayya. Then, oh my, Lord, oh my Lord, sijn, this prison is more beloved to me, muhabbat, is more lovable to me, more liked by me, more beloved to me, than the sin, the sin of zina, towards which they're inviting Right? This is incredible that Sayyidina Yusuf al Islam, his statement, he's saying that, Ya Allah, the prison is dearer to me than what these women are calling me to. I just want you to imagine, think about yourself in that situation. Think about the taqwa of Yusuf, Sayyidina Yusuf al Islam. Think about the piety of Sayyidina Yusuf al Islam. Think about the chastity, the haya of Sayyidina Yusuf al Islam. He is saying that I would love being in prison. Getting the embarrassment of being in prison, being disgraced, being in prison, being in prison and having no future, <laughs> sacrificing my entire future by being imprisoned forever in prison, right? In jail. I'm willing. That is more beloved to me. That is more dearer to me than being imprisoned and having no future than being in a place where he is being, he is even being invited to commit this. Not even doing this. <laughs> He's been getting an invitation to do that sin in this place. He's saying, I don't want to be even in this place when I'm getting an invitation. Allah, this is very hard. This is a tremendous sacrifice. This is tremendous haya, right? And this is, you know, Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam, he is the role model for the men of today, right? He's saying that I would rather go in prison, rather sacrifice my entire future than to be in a place where I'm getting an invitation of sin. So Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam, he wanted to be away from this invitation of zina. That was the sin here, right? And this is actually what Allah says in Quran as well. Wala takrabu, wala takrabu zina. Wala takrabu. That don't even go near zina. Don't even go close to zina. And there is Allah, Allah ka ek hukum hai. We should do amal on that hukum. But every hukum has hikmat. And this is what we are teaching to our SEPI students as well this semester. That sometimes you may be able to understand the reason, the wisdom, the benefit, the faida. Faida to hai. Chai samaj mein aaya na aaya. Faida har hukum ki piche faida. But our obedience to that hukum is not conditional on us understanding the faida or not. We just say, Samet na wa ata'an. Allah, we listen and we obey. But then, yes, Allah also wants us to understand that 
it's the benefit something is going to benefit it's going to benefit you it's for your sake so many ulama many mufassirin many in fact doctors as well then they tell us about the disastrous effect of zina one thing which the mufassirin have written is that a person who commits this falls into the sin that person will disastrous disastrously fall in their deen as well there will be a disaster for that person's taqwa their ikhlas their haya their salah the remembrance of Allah will go down. Similarly, the second thing they mention about the perils of zina is that they will also go down in the ability to learn ilm. In the ability to learn ilm. Because ilm is nur and zina is zulmat. And these two things cannot be combined together in one heart where you have zulmat, the darkness of zina, as well as the nur of ilm, the light of knowledge. So a person will go down in the ability to learn knowledge and to retain knowledge. Similarly, number three, they will lose their intelligence and wisdom, their hikmat, their ability to think, make rational decisions. That ability will also go down. Their wisdom will go down. Their intelligence, IQ will decrease as a result of this. And number four, they mentioned that Allah will decrease the baraka in their risk and in their memory. Any people say baraka nahi hai. One of the reasons why baraka is sucked away is because of this sin. Allah takes away baraka from the risk. They're earning you know, thousands, but there is no baraka in that risk. They're not able to make their ends meet. And memory also. Sometimes a person says that I learned so many things, but I'm not able to remember. Many students, they complain about this as well, right? But not necessarily for this reason, right? It's just general weak halves up, right? Uh, but this is another thing which can actually make a person lose that baraka in their memory as well. They're yad kartem, and they're not able to memorize, not able to remember. Number six is that Allah will take away the nur from their faces. Because zulmat, it doesn't just come in their heart, it also manifests on their faces. The nur of iman, the nur of taqwa, the nur of haya, that is taken away even from their faces. Their faces become dull, right? Their faces become bland. They don't have that freshness, that light, that illumination. That rohaniyat and that nuraniyat on their face anymore because of this sin. And number six, that they will begin to hate people of taqwa. They will begin to hate people who are righteous. Okay? They won't even want to sit in the company of those who, who, are, who are pious or who have a ta'aluk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lastly, that they might even start feeling malice towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just having malice towards the people, pious people of Allah, but also having a malice, a rancor, kina for, for Allah subhanahu wa himself. So this is a very important uh, uh, aspect of our life that one should try to save themselves from this sin. And what we see in this story of Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam is we learn a lesson that how did he save himself from this sin? He saved himself from this sin by leaving that place of sin by accepting isolation and seclusion from that company, from that place, which is inviting him to commit this sin. He went into the khalwat, the seclusion, the prison of that jail, right? And he said, that will allow me to save myself from this place, which is inviting me to commit sin. And this is the lesson which applies to us as well. That if we want to save ourselves from this sin, we'll also have to do amal, revive this sunnah of Sayyidina Yusuf that if you're getting an invitation of a sin from a particular gathering, from a particular person, we also have to adopt isolation. We also have to adopt the khalbat, the seclusion, not of the cave, not of the jail. We have to adopt the isolation of our musalla, of our janamas. That will be our prison. That will be our seclusion. That will be our sanctuary. That will be our home. That would be our refuge, right? We can, in fact, a person can make this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, Yusuf al-Islam, in order to save himself from this sin, he did ruju ilallah, he turned to Allah, and he went inside the prison, the jail. Allah, I have taken myself out of this gathering, and I have come on this prison of my musallam, my jana mansa. And I'm also turning to you, and Ya Allah, I ask you to please save me from this sin. And truly, if a person makes this dua from their heart, 
they pray two rakat and they make this dua to Allah Ta'ala from their heart. This is Allah will save them from this sin. Many people were sort of struggling with this, right? This is a very effective remedy for leaving the unlawful loves and desires. Uh, another thing which we learned from the Sunnah, the Prophet said to a Sahabi that if you have these, if you have this problem in your heart, then increase your fasting because fasting will become a shield. Or get married if you're able to, right? Get married if you're able to. If you're not able to get married, if you're not able to marry, then fast because fasting helps the person control these emotions, these desires. And one of the things that uh, the that uh, our teachers or scholars have mentioned is another dua, which is actually quite beautiful, because you know when you have a relationship of love, whether lawful, unlawful or lawful, either way, it applies to both. There is a stage. There are stages. There are feelings. There are emotions. It starts with an emotion which you call rahbat, that you have a rahbat for some person. Rahbat means that you just have an inclination for that individual, right? Then that feeling intensifies and it becomes into a talab. Now you have a desire for that person. So desire, talab is a bit more than a rahbat. Then when that talab intensifies, it takes to stage three, level three, which is that you have muhabbat for that person. Love. So ragbat, talab, and then muhabbat. And then when a person is totally infatuated in love, right, you are just head over heels over that person. You make that person, you just try, you end up worshipping that person, right? It's quite the ilah. You make that person like your, you know, your, your idol, right? You idolize that person. Idol, that's the word, right? Idol. You adore that person so much. So you have these four words, right? So from that, you can actually make a sentence and a dua that you can say to someone, just like you can have these relationships for unlawful loves, right? You can also have these relationships for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And you can say like, la marhubi illa Allah. That I have no object of rahbat except you, ya Allah. La matlubi illa Allah. Allah have no object of desire except for you. La mahabubi illa Allah. I have no mahabub, no object of love except for you. And la ilaha illa Allah. I have no object of worship other than you. So this is now, and truly this is so true, right? That's really what the kalama is. La marhubi illa Allah. La matlubi illa Allah. La mahabubi illa Allah. And la ilaha illa Allah. There's no... Because la ila, that's the pinnacle, that's the mirage of muhabbat. That there's no object to worship except for you. So if a person makes this dua well, in a few times every day, this also is a very effective cleaner of the heart. And I also mentioned one permanent way. So these are like small effective remedies. The permanent way to get rid of these worldly loves, these unlawful loves, is actually it's just one, which Allah gives us in the Quran, which is to remember of Remember Allah, remembrance of Allah. Because at the end of the day, these worldly loves, what are you trying to get? What's the maqsad? You know? What's the goal? What's the objective? You're trying to get contentment in your heart, right? That's what you're, it's been on. That's what every person, Muslim or non-Muslim, that's what they're trying to get. And that is, Allah Ta'ala knew that Muslims would want to do whatever their hearts will find contentment, whatever will give its menan to their hearts. So Allah taught us in the Quran that the way to get real its menan, Allah be zikr Allah tatma innul kulu. That all humanity know that indeed only and only in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find that its menan. In fact, you will see a Muslim boy or a Muslim girl when they watch TV, when they watch music, when they watch movie, when they listen to music, when they're in some kind of a relationship with another person, at the core, what they're wanting, what they're seeking, what they're longing is it menan in their heart. That's what they want. But the moment that TV, that two hour movie is over, that same loneliness comes back. That same emptiness comes back. That same vacuum comes back. They're still lonely, right? Allah is saying in the Quran that the only thing in the entire universe that is going to bring true peace, true itmanan, 
true contentment, true happiness to your heart is dhikr of Allah's father, is the remembrance of Allah. And this is the most important thing. And I'll say one more important thing, and this is, I want you to listen to this very carefully, right? A man or a woman who has tasted the worldly pleasures, who has tasted these worldly loves, if they have sinned, if they have tasted the pleasures that this world has to offer, there is only one thing that can take you out from those pleasures. And if you really want to be taken out, if that's the need of someone, that if you really want to be taken out, if you really want to leave your sins, if you're ashamed about sort of what you have done, if you want to be a person that, yeah, Allah, I also want to make myself pleasing to you. I'm not happy with these things that I do. I'm not happy with the things I see. I might get some temporary pleasure. I might get some fleeting pleasure. But afterwards, afterwards I always feel bad about this. I feel sad about this. I feel weak. I feel empty inside. Then there's only one thing that can take you out. Only one thing that can take you out. Because you know, if you have tasted the pleasure of this world, the one thing that can take you out is to taste the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu To taste the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu to taste the pleasure in your salah, to taste the pleasure in your zikr, to taste the pleasure of the Quran. If you feel that lazat, the sweetness, the sweet taste of being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the only thing that can take you out of these worldly pleasures. It's the only thing that can take a young man and a young woman out of their life of sin. Because obviously you take yourself out of that worldly pleasure you need to hook yourself up with the greater pleasure. Nafs is a creature of pleasure. You need to give it pleasure. It's a question of which pleasure. The lower level worldly pleasures or the greater, the greatest pleasure, which is the... thinking about Allah Subhanahu in any way that you want to. Anyway, just 24 hours, anyway, just think about Allah. It's just a simple mental exercise. Try, you do so many mental exercises, just try to remember him in your heart. Just try to feel him in your life. Because if I ask you, if I ask any young man or a young woman who commits sin, I ask them that at that moment when you were committing a sin, did you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now she will say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I totally forgotten Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I had completely forgotten Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I had forgotten that Allah exists. I had forgotten the book of Allah. I had forgotten the Rasul of Allah. I had forgotten the commandments of Allah. Right? I had forgotten the kalam of Allah and everything. Right? So if you forgot all of those things, then how can a person hope to be Abdullah, right, at that moment, in that time? How can a person carry and live such a life as if it's a servant of Allah's father? So the first thing to do is very simple. We just have to remember Allah more and more in any way, in your heart, in your mind, in your life. And this is one of the greatest things that Allah has given to a Muslim. This remembrance of Allah, because in fact, people in America, they, they cry about this. They're trying to fill their emptiness in their heart by taking drugs or getting a nicotine tablet or a shot of this, that, or the other. Still have this vacuum, this emptiness in their heart. But Allah has given, because of being a Muslim, this incredible gift of Iman, this gift of this nur of Iman, this light of Iman, this, this, this solace, this itmanam that comes when a person thinks about Allah's path. And Allah wants us to engage with him in a very dynamic way. Look in Quran, if Allah wanted, Allah could have just sent us to this earth, to this planet, and said that I'm going to meet you on the day of Qiyamah. This is the Quran, this is the Sunnah, this is going to be sufficient for you, I'm going to meet you on that day. But Allah subhanahu wa does not do that. Allah does not, does not, doesn't do that with us. Allah subhanahu wa says in Quran that, Kuwa ma'akum aina ma'akuntum. That, oh my servant, I'm with you wherever you are. You are in this auditorium. I'm with you right now. When you're outside the auditorium, I'm going to be with you at that time. When you're inside the home, I'm with you. Outside the home, I'm with you. When you're in the marketplace, I'm with you. When you're in the masjid, I'm with you. 
when you're sinning, I'm still with you. I'm, I'm waiting for you to come back. Allah never pulls the plug on us. Allah is always waiting for us. Always waiting. And in fact, Allah takes it one step further. Allah says, فَإِنِّي قَرِيب, I'm قَرِيبُ to you. نَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ I'm closer to you than your own jugular vein. And if that's how close to you I am. If someone is smelly, we don't want to be close to that person. If someone is stinking, you say, just go away from me. We don't like people who are smelling, have a bad mouth, a bad foul smell. But look at Allah's path. And Allah is so kareem, so raheem, that despite the stench of our sins, despite the foulness of, of the actions that we have done, Allah is saying that I'm not just with you, I'm not just near you, I'm closer to you than your own very self. That's Allah's path. And that's what a tragedy, right? That we have such a beautiful being with us all the time. That Allah subhanahu wa is with us. Allah wants us to answer this call. And if you turn to him, if you make the Allah is dead, if he's so close to us, our response should be that Allah, I want to make this pledge with you. I want to make this irada, this intention with you, that I also want to feel Allah in my life. I want to feel you in my life. And this is, you know, a young man, a young boy, a young girl, they can turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make this their call. To turn back to Allah, that's what Allah says, Allah. Turn back to Allah. Repent back to Allah. Toba is a paradigm shift. I'll come to you in arms length. If you come to me in arms length, I will come to you walking. In Atani Yamshi to Harwala. If you come to me walking, I will come to you running. That's how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Right? Allah subhanahu is the most merciful of beings. Allah wants us to draw close to him. So may Allah subhanahu give all of us the ability today that we can bring back Allah subhanahu in our lives, that we can turn back to Allah subhanahu sincerely, and we can also make ourselves pleasing to him. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillah.